So, um, boy, we've been, we've been going through this series. We're wrapping up this series called God Still Speaks. And I have been loving it because, man, the Lord has just uh, been sharing so much with us and, and uh, I think speaking a lot through these, through these Old Testament prophets. Um, I know even just, uh, you know, this, just this last week as we're talking about just the Holy Spirit at work in us, that, that we, don't, we don't work on our own power, our own strength, and if we want to see the power of, of God in our lives, we need to step out and try to do things that only God could do, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And we can, we can experience that um, in our lives. And uh, looking forward to, uh, to today's message. I, I, I think it's going to be a good challenge for us and I hope you will I hope you will really catch what I believe God has to say to us today I'm sure those of you who are parents have experienced this um, what I'm about to share um, in your in your lives in your experience with your kids if you haven't yet um, I think you probably will um, in some form or fashion um, as parents um, go through this. I think I've probably gone through it in one way or another with each of my kids. This specific instance, um, this scenario, I had taken, uh, been, I went to a ball game with one of my boys, and I'm not going to tell you which one because they, 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 like, they don't mind me telling you if it makes them look good when it's kind of a, uh, otherwise they prefer if I keep them anonymous. Anyway, um, so uh, we're at the ball game, and uh, um, like boys usually do at some point, he said, Dad, I want something to eat. So, uh, so I give him five bucks, and uh, he comes back with a bag of Skittles. Okay, so comes back with some Skittles, a bigger bag than this, but uh, he has the Skittles, and, uh, and I'm like, oh, nice. I go, well, let me have a few Skittles, um, and he just kind of gave me a funny look, and I'm like, come on, give me, give me a few Skittles, and then he says those words, right? He says, no, these Skittles are what? These Skittles are mine. They're mine. By this time, I'm kind of freaking out a little bit because there's something that he just doesn't understand about this situation, right? He's missing something here. He's missing, first of all, number one, I bought those Skittles for him. And so technically, they're still mine, right? Number two, I'm big enough, I'm strong enough, I could take the whole bag of Skittles from him if I wanted to. And number three, if I wanted to, I could rain down more Skittles on him than he could ever eat in a day, right? I could buy him so many Skittles. When our children act like this, they fail to realize that, 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 that there's a bigger picture going on. They don't see the big picture. And really, if that attitude is kind of is left unchecked, it's, it's not going to change. In fact, it's probably going to get worse. Because the issue is not really about the Skittles, right? The issue is really about the heart. It's an issue of the heart. This is exactly what happened when Malachi comes on the scene here. We're going to be talking about Malachi today, so you can grab your Bibles, you can turn there. Remember, the Israelites have been taken into captivity. They were held there for 70 years in Babylon. Um, eventually, they are set free. They can go back if they want to go back. Many of them stayed, but this small remnant of them went back to Jerusalem to rebuild their lives, to rebuild the temple of God. But you remember, they, they, we talked about the fact that after a little while, they kind of, they, they um, I don't know, the enthusiasm kind of ended. And then, you know, they kind of didn't really want to build that anymore. They started neglecting God, neglecting God's house, and, and kind of focused on their own lives, focused on their own house. Remember, we talked about that. Whose house are you building? Is God really first in your life? But then there was this period of recovery when things kind of seemed to be going really well for them. In fact, it was going so well that then their hearts turned cold towards God. And they became kind of morally and spiritually mediocre. And I want to read to you now out of Malachi chapter 2. Look at verse 17. This is kind of describing kind of the attitude and the hearts of the people at that time. It says, uh, chapter 2, verse 17, You have wearied the Lord with your words. 
But you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? So he, he's saying, you're kind of getting your, your, your thoughts and your morality and your spirituality all mixed up to where you're kind of thinking like those that are doing wrong, oh, those are, those are the good guys. Oh, those are the good guys. Those are the guys you want to be like. They're, and, you're, and they're just getting all, their, their hearts are just getting all twisted around and messed up. And then look at chapter 3, verse 6. It says, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Have not kept them. They're basically kind of saying, they turned away from God and they're kind of like saying, no, God, these are my Skittles. These are my Skittles. This kind of bums God out. God's pretty bummed out. He wants to have a much better relationship with them than that. So he calls on them to return. He says in the last part of chapter 7, he says, return to me. I want you to return to me. He doesn't want to have this broken relationship with them. He doesn't want them just distant from him. He wants to have a close relationship with them. So he says, return to me. But look at how he suggests that happens. Look at the second part of verse 7. Return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes um, and contributions. You are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into your storehouse that there may be food in my house. Let's stop right there. They asked God, they said, they said how, how are we supposed to return to you? And he says, stop robbing me. And, and they're like, well, how are we robbing you? And they said, well, well, you're not bringing the whole tithe into my storehouse. You're not bringing the whole tithe into my storehouse. Now listen, if you think about it, why does God say, well, I want you to return to me. And the way you're going to return to me, the way your hearts are going to get close to me again, is I want you to give to me. I want you to give me A tithe. That's how you're going to get close to me. Isn't that interesting? Now, why does God say that? It's because God knows he made us. He knows our hearts. He knows our struggles. And he knows, just like Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He knows that about us. He knows that's how we're wired. He knows that's how we think. He knows that's how we feel. Charles Swindoll said this, we honor God by first giving him from our paycheck. In doing so, we acknowledge his ownership of everything before we enjoy any of it ourselves. Whatever your income, give a portion of it to the Lord first. He will be honored and glorified by your trust. Martin Luther said this, when a person is converted, three conversions are necessary, head, heart, and purse. And of the three, the purse is the hardest. Isn't that the truth? It's the truth. Now, we start talking about this in the, in the church, though. Here's what pe- some people will begin to think. Here we go again. Here we go. The church just going to go after my money, right? The church just wants to talk about go- going after my money. Well, if you think that that's the case, then, then I got to tell you, you, you're just missing the heart of God. You're missing the heart, the heart of God. It's not really about your Skittles. It's not really about your Skittles. It's about your heart. It's about your heart. In order to keep his people's hearts in the right place, he put this requirement on them in the Mosaic Law. He put this requirement on them to give a tenth. They're supposed to give a 10%, a tithe. That's what a tithe means, 10%. Give 10% back to him. Now, a lot of people want to argue, well, we're not under the Old Testament law, therefore, we're not required to give 10%. And you know, whether you believe that's true or not, I I believe that even if God still doesn't require a tithe, I believe he still desires a tithe. And I want to share with you why I believe that that's true. The first occurrence of tithing um, that we see it all in the Bible 
There's giving that goes on way back with Cain and Abel, but, but when you see just about the tithe, about the 10%, it's in way back in Genesis chapter 14. Abraham meets Melchizedek, who was the first priest that we ever hear of. Abraham returned from this great victory um, in, in this battle, in this, in this victory, and he comes, and, and Melchizedek, who he hadn't met yet, comes out, and in his ministry, he brings him bread and something to drink. And he gives it to him and he ministers to Abraham. And Abraham, in response to that ministry, says, here, I'm going to give you 10% to support his ministry. Isn't that interesting? The first priest of God appears in the Bible. Tithes are collected to support the ministry. The next occurrence of tithing comes when Jacob is at Bethel. There Jacob saw a symbol of salvation with the, you know, the Jacob's ladder, this ladder coming down from heaven, and the angels are, are descending and ascending. And, and Jacob, knowing that the presence of God is there, he calls it Bethel, Bethel, the house of God. And he vowed that if God would bless him, he would return to that place. And he says this, he says, this stone that I've set up as a pillar um, and will be God's house and all that you give me or all that you bless me with, I will then give you a tenth. I'm going to tithe out of the way that you bless me, out of all that you give me. Both of, both of these instances that we see, yes, in the Old Testament, but you know that that happened before the Mosaic Law. Before the Mosaic Law, the law where we say, well, we're not under that anymore. Well, guess what? It, it, it was there before the law. Tithing happened even before the law. And so I don't think it's just about the law. Before the Mosaic required the law, I think it's what God desired from people. It's what was given to honor God. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus, while confronting the Pharisees, states that, that, that tithing is something that they should not neglect. Jesus acknowledges the benefit of tithing. In 1 Corinthians 16, Paul directs, he says this, Now about the collection of God's people, do what I told the Galatian church to do. On the very first day of each week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. Okay, In keeping with his income or in proportion to his income. Okay, so here he's giving instructions about, about giving. He's saying, but you should give in proportion to your income. You know what that means? The more you make, the more you should give, right? It's not like a flat amount, like everybody should give $20 a week or whatever it is. It, it's in proportion to your income. The more, the more you're blessed financially, the more you should give. Well, how do we figure out what that proportion should be? Well, there's a biblical principle there, the tithe. It's a biblical principle you can argue against if you want to, but whether God requires the tithe today of us or not, I believe wholeheartedly, it's hard to say sometimes, I believe wholeheartedly that that's something that God still desires of us. He's honored by it. I believe God is honored by it. And the bottom line here is that we shouldn't try to be figuring out how little we can give to God. But we do, if we think about it, so many times we're trying to figure out how, what's the littlest amount I can give to God financially. Think, is that really the right heart? Man, we should be trying to figure out what's the most I can give to God. What's the most I can give to God? Because He is so good. He has blessed me in so many ways. He deserves it. I want to honor Him every way that I can. Is our giving, do we give in a way that honors God? All right, a few things I want us to realize here. The first thing we got to realize is that all the Skittles are the Lord's. All Skittles are the Lord's. Psalm 50 verse 10 says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. That's what the Lord says. Everything's mine. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Here's a funny thing. He not only owns the cattle that is on a thousand hills, he owns the hills on which those thousands of cattle exist. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. There is not anything that's made or exists that God does not own. He owns it all. Even we are God's possessions. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, You are not your own. You were bought at a price. 
He owns us. He created it all. He owns it all. He owns all the Skittles. Not only does he own us and our possessions, but he's the one who, who, who gives us the wisdom and the ability to wor- earn every single penny that you have earned. You might say, well, no, I've done it. I've gone out, I got my education, or I got my training, and I work my way up, and I work hard, and, and, and I'm good at what I do, and I've earned that money. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to even get wealth. Those skills, that mentality, all a gift from the Lord. We really need to realize that all we have and all we ever will have is because God either gives it to us or he allows us to have it. There's nothing we can do or own without God. We also got to realize something else. Your Skittles, your Skittles, they're the key to your heart. Your Skittles are the key to your heart. Jesus used dozens of examples and stories throughout the the, the New Testament of people's possessions and finances because he knows that our finances are the number one rival to God for the human heart. Money is the number one rival to God for the human heart. He knows that. He knows us. The Bible says, talking about finances, no one can serve two masters. They will love one and despise the other. No one can serve God and money. The real issue is our hearts. And the real issue with our hearts is who's going to be number one? Who's going to be number one? If God's going to be number one in your life, then you have to trust him with your Skittles. There's nothing wrong with having a lot of Skittles. But you've got to trust it all to God. You've got to say, God, I understand that, that, that it's yours. And I want to do with it whatever you want me to do with it. You've blessed me with a lot. Okay, God, what do you want me to do with this, all this? You've blessed me with a little. Okay, God, I still want to be faithful even with this little snack pack. Your Skittles are the key to your heart. Third thing we need to learn is that we've got to learn to give them away. We've got to learn to give our Skittles away. Look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. He says again, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may, be good, there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Well, let's go. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that you will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the fields shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed for you will f- shall be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. He's saying, you know what? I want, I, I want, you, to, I want you to give and, and I want you to test me and I want you to see that I, I'm gonna bless you. I'm gonna bless you. That's an incredible promise. More than a promise, it's a challenge. He challenges us. What this verse is teaching and what I alluded to at the beginning when I, when I said I could rain down more Skittles on my son than he could ever, that he could ever eat um, and dream of is this verse is saying, God's saying, hey, I want you to try it. Taste the rainbow. I want you to try it. He says you'll be amazed at the blessings that you'll experience when you learn to be a giver. You'll be blown away by your blessings when you learn to be a giver. Unreserved commitment results in unrestrained blessing. When you hold nothing back from God, he holds nothing back from you. If if we do not withhold our entire hearts from God, he will not withhold his abundant blessings in our lives. It's the truth. And what I want you to hear right now is I am not saying, I am not saying if you give your money to God, he's going to make you rich. I'm not saying, oh, plant your seed here at our church and all of a sudden you're just going to have this just financial overflow in your life. That's not what I'm saying. And a lot of people will tell you, you know, there are some preachers out there that are saying, that's not what I'm saying here. I am saying that when you learn to trust God when you're, with your finances and, and, and you become a, a, a giver like he wants you to be, you will be blessed by God. Now, it may or may not come in the form of a financial blessing. Sometimes it does. 
Other times it's another kind of blessing. I don't know what kind of way he's going to bless you in your life. But I know that when we learn to trust God with our entire hearts, and this is the key to our hearts, that, and we, begin to, we, we start to become a giver like, like he wants us to be, and like he is, we are going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. It's going to, you're going to be blessed in a wide variety of ways because your heart is going to grow closer to him. When you begin to trust him with your whole heart, and the only way to do that is to trust him with your skittles, then your heart is going to grow closer to God. And your heart getting closer to God can result in nothing else than you being blessed in your life. Do you believe that today? That being said, let me share this. Sir John Templeton, chairman of the $15 billion Templeton Fund, has, qu- has been quoted as saying this, I have watched over 100,000 families over my years of investment counseling, and I've always seen greater prosperity and happiness among those families who tithed than among those who didn't. Putting God first means that we trust him to take care of us. And who do you trust more? Who do you trust more? You trust yourself or do you trust God? I think a lot of times we trust ourselves. We might not say it out loud, but, but we still do because we're not willing to open up our hand and say, okay, God, here's my Skittles. I'll do whatever you want me to do with them. Too many people have the attitude that's found here in verse, verse 13 of chapter 3. He says, your words have been hard against me, says the Lord, but you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is in vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of us walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. He, he's saying that, you, you know what it's like? It's, you're, it's like you're saying, you know, it's not really worth it to obey God. It's not really, wor- not really worth it to trust God. It's not really worth it to, to trust him with my finances. It's not worth it to have an open hand with my Skittles. It's not worth it to tithe. Kathy and I really try to, we try to really look at that, that first 10% is not even really ours at all. I mean, yeah, he owns it all. He owns everything, and we're going to do whatever he wants with everything. But, man, that first 10%, that, that's not ours to even debate over. That just belongs to him. It's God's. It's not ours to spend. It's his. Reality is, as a church, and if we would all trust him with our Skittles and give to him what he would like us to give and become the kind of givers he wants us to give. This church would, we'd have more finances than we know what to do with. There's so much ministry that we'd begin doing. It it, it would be amazing to see. God's always used the resources of his people to accomplish his work. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty awesome that we get to be a part of that and that that's how he works. But, but it's no different for us. And until we all do our part, we're going to be limited in what we accomplish for him if we don't do our part. Here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. And what I want us to grab a hold of today. God's desire for us to give is motivated by his desire for our hearts to be close to his. That, that's, that's the whole purpose for the, the whole Old Testament law. I mean, the whole law, including the, the, you know, the, the, the command to tithe, was all given to, to hem in the hearts of man and direct those hearts towards God. God gives commands because he wants our hearts to be close to his. That's the whole purpose. That's why when they said, well, what's the greatest commandment in the whole law? What did he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. He's going, the reason why I give you all, you know, give you laws and commands and all that is because I just want your heart to be close to mine. 
And so his desire for us to give isn't because he, he's just trying to uh, you know, keep a clamp on us or put us down or keep us under control. It's because he wants our hearts. And he knows, he knows, until we trust him with our Skittles, he doesn't really have our hearts. Until we trust him with our Skittles, he doesn't really have our hearts, not completely. I want to read to you out of chapter 1. When I was reading through this, this uh, I was reading through Malachi this last week. I, I, I don't know, I read it differently this time. I've always kind of read Malachi where God's just kind of mad and upset because they weren't given enough. But I read, I was reading it from a different perspective this time. And I want to read to you out of chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, because I hear and hear, and see if you can't see it too. I, I, don't, I don't hear an angry God I hear a God with a broken heart. I hear a God with a broken heart. Look at chapter 1, verse 6. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I'm a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts. To you, O priests, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, have we polluted you by saying that the Lord's table may be despised? When you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? He's, he's saying, you know, uh, if I'm really your father, then honor me like you should honor a father. He's going, you bring your second best. You, you, you're bringing me your, your lamb, but you're, you're going, well, this one's, this one's lame anywhere. This one's blind. This one's no good anyway. Let, if we're going to have to sacrifice something to God, let's kill the diseased one. Let's kill the one that's dying anyway. That way we don't, that way we don't have to give up any of our good lambs. How sad is that? How honoring to God is that? God, we're going to give you our leftovers. We're going to give you the worst of what we have. He even says, try giving that to the government. Try doing that with your government. See what they say. And yet you want to do that with me? Come on. I just see his heart is broken. Because he's going, this isn't about your Skittles. It's about your heart. And I want your heart to be close to me. I want us to be in a close relationship. That's why I want you to become a good giver. Because I want you to be like me. And I want you to trust me. And when you start doing that, man, we're going to get closer and closer. And God's saying, that's what I want. That's what I want. Here's a question that each of us, I think, needs to answer today. Here's what I think we each need to answer today. Am I giving in a way that honors God the way he should be honored? Do I give in a way that honors God the way he should be honored? That's really the bottom line. You can argue about the tithe, the no tithe, whatever. Are you giving in a way that honors God the way he should be honored? I heard a story, and I'm going to close with this, of a missionary in Africa. He received a knock on his door on, on, on his hut one afternoon, and, and uh, he opened up the door. He saw this, uh, this little um, uh, uh, indigenous boy there, uh, this, this, this little native boy holding a, a large fish in his hands. And he, and, he, and he gives it to, to, to the pastor. He says, you taught, us, you taught us that we should tithe, so here you go. And so he takes it, and he says, well, if this is, if this is one-tenth of what you caught, where's the other nine fish? And he goes, oh, they're still back in the lake. I haven't caught them yet. Do you see the heart? That's what God wants. He wants us to just say, God, we want to honor you. We trust you. So we want to be a giver the way you want us to. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you'd forgive us because, God, we struggle with this. Some of us struggle more than others. 
But I think we all struggle to keep our hands open, open wide to you, understanding that, God, you own, you own all the Skittles. And you want us to trust us, trust you with ours. Forgive us when we don't trust you. Forgive us when we trust ourselves more than you. Forgive us when we don't give in a way that honors you, the way a father, the way a master should be honored. And God, I think that's why the tithe is important. Because it's just a great reminder. It's a great way to to hold ourselves accountable and hold ourselves in check. To say, oh, no, I need to remember I'm trusting the Lord with everything in my life. And so, God, I pray that you'd help us to be better givers. I pray that you'd help us to trust you more. Because Lord, we do want to be close to you. And we do want to honor you. Because you deserve it. We love you. We praise you. We honor you here this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing together.